Well, if you had told me when 2020 started that I would preach three times in an auditorium for our weekend experience with nobody in the auditorium, I would have laughed at you. But this is the reality that we live in in 2020, and I have to say that this has not taken God by surprise. And so I'm going to continue in a series that Pastor Ron started a couple of weeks ago. He started a series that he called Walk It Out. In that first week, he talked about walking worthy of the calling of God. And last week, you heard him talk about walking in the peace of God. And this morning, I want to take a stab at part three of this message series and walking in step with the Spirit. And so if you have your Bibles, there's going to be one particular verse that we're looking at today. It's in Galatians chapter 5. I want to give you an opportunity to turn there, but all the Scripture that we share today, all the major points that we'll be talking about will be on the screen as well. But in the NIV version of Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25, that's where we're going to find the main verse for today. And this is what it says. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Walk in step with the Spirit. Will you join me as we start our our message today? I want to invite the Lord's presence because I think the Holy Spirit is going to speak something profound to us today as we continue with the message. Lord, I thank you for your presence from the beginning of our worship experience to now, God. Your presence has been among us. It's been inside us. You've been speaking to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in these next few moments, God, as I share from Scripture, as I share some stories, God, as we're reminded of who you are and how the Holy Spirit works in our life, God, I pray that you speak directly to each person, that you minister directly to each person exactly what is needed today by the power and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. I thank you you're going to guard my words, that you're going to cause the words that I share to be exactly what you want to convey. And if I miss it, God, I pray that what is heard is going to be what you want heard, even if I'm not saying it the right way, God. I want it to reach their hearts, God. And I pray that all of us will reach a point of life change as a result of the experience today. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, psychologists describe the physiological response that we have when we have an unsettling or high-stress experience as a fight-or-flight response, a fight-or-flight. Hormones, adrenaline, our muscles tighten, our heart rate races, but there are high-level events that happen that we call a fight-or-flight scenario. And it's in those times that we have some marker events that often become memories that really mark our lives. Uh, I know there are some staff members this week, multiple staff members this week, that were involved getting COVID nasal swab tests. And I can definitely tell you that they felt the fight or flight syndrome when they were in there with that nurse tech about to have that nasal swab stuck up their nose. And those of you who have been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are some other times in our life, though, maybe it's on the job. Maybe you have a big presentation that you think you have more time for, and your boss stops by, and he, he says that he wants to hear about your report today, and you're not ready, and you have that fight-or-flight reflex. You guys know what that is. You know, it's that twinge in the back of your neck. It's that surge of adrenaline that goes through the, that lets you know that, that, that something's up, that you're going to have to figure it out. It's unsettling. Uh, your, your heightened senses are there, and, and sometimes in the midst of a fight or flight response, we don't have the best mental acuity when it comes to really articulating what's going on. I I find that interesting uh, when you have a fender bender. Maybe you've had a car accident. You ever notice the adrenaline pump that goes through you when you have a car accident? Well, I thought it would be interesting maybe to go look at some actual accident reports of how people tried to articulate what happened to him right after an accident. And sure enough, while that adrenaline was pumping, there wasn't a lot of mental clarity that was going on in their mind. So maybe you'll get a kick out of some of these. I found a lot of these reports humorous. These are actual written reports for traffic accidents that had happened. Here's the first one. Coming home, I drove into the wrong house and collided with the tree I don't have. Wow. Wow. Thank you, camera guys, for the courtesy laugh. It's a cold room in here today. <laughs> How about this one? The other car collided with mine without giving warning of its intention. Okay. All right. Here's a really good one. 
I thought my window was down, but I found out it was up when I put my head through it. I collided with a stationary truck, stationary truck, coming the other way. All right, I knew you'd like that one. How about this one? This guy was all over the road. I had to swerve a number of times before I hit him. How about this one? And I apologize to my mother-in-law in advance for this one. I pulled away from the side of the road. I glanced at my mother-in-law, and I headed over the embankment. How about this one? In an attempt to kill a fly, in an attempt to kill a fly, I drove into a telephone pole. Wow, that is commitment. How about this one? This is a driver who has been driving way too long in, in one stretch here. I had been driving for 40 years when I fell asleep at the wheel and had an accident. That is a lot of driving in one continuous time, isn't it? How about this one? As I approached an intersection, a sign suddenly appeared in a place where no stop sign had ever appeared before. I was unable to stop in time to avoid the accident. We can all laugh at those reports, but it's interesting when we're in those fight or flight response times that we have things like that happen and we have marker events that happen that kind of shape and mold our life. And I want to take a few moments and talk about that. I want to talk about some of those marker and shaping events that are going on because I think the year 2020 has been full of adrenaline dumps over and over again of us hoping to accomplish something, of getting to do something, of being let down, of having to pivot, of having to change. And over and over again, we're dealing with this frustration of fight or flight or whatever you want to call it, of a response of just generally not feeling like life is going the way we want. And we're full of stress. 2020 has been full of stress, health concerns, financial concerns, societal concerns, social concerns, rapid changes to our schedule, the adrenaline, the hormones, the different things that are going on, people losing their jobs, marital issues, family conflict. Over and over again, you and I are experiencing wave after wave of the fight or flight response. You know, I used to think I could unwind if I would just maybe look at the social media feed. That was my way of maybe unwinding. But the more I'm looking at it this year, a whole lot of stressed out people have taken over my social media feed. I mean, you guys could really use to show me some more family pictures, some more pictures of what you ate for lunch, uh, maybe some cute pet pictures that you have instead of some of the stuff that I'm seeing posted on my news feed. You know, how about this? I want to give you an example of maybe a, a great post that you could have. Uh, how would you like to see a picture of me riding a yak in China? I mean, that's a one once in a lifetime experience. Does that sound good? Here you go. Here you go. There I am. There I am. Now that is a social media worthy post there. Now don't you feel less stressed now just by seeing me riding that yak? We live in a world that is stressed out. You know, our first century Christians that we look at in the Bible were, were in a, a similar situation. They had adrenaline pumping events happening around them all the time. Uh, they, they even had more severe things happening to them. Their persecution was at another level. They were being imprisoned. They were being put to death. And they had major stressors everywhere they turned. But as I've been studying in these last few weeks, as I've been praying and trying to discern where my place is in all of this as I'm walking out 2020, I've been looking in the book of Acts, and I've been looking at the disciples and how they responded, those early Christians in that first century, and how they responded. And over and over again, as I look at the book of Acts, as I look at how Paul wrote letters even after the birth of the church in Acts, I see over and over again that there was a clear priority that those disciples, no matter what stressors they were under, wanted to be led and in step with the Holy Spirit. Over and over again, even if it cost them their lives, you can see in Acts where it says they were led by the Holy Spirit. They, were, they had the Holy Spirit come upon them and they did things in His name. Over and over again, the church grew and expanded and their lives were enriched and they were able to follow the call of God in their life because they got in step with what the Holy Spirit was doing. The verse that we started with this morning, Galatians 5, 25, since we live by the Spirit, 
Let us keep in step with the Spirit. If you don't hear anything else I say today, I want to get one big idea across to you today from that Scripture and from the rest of the time that we have together. And this is what I would say. In times of uncertainty, look for the Holy Spirit. In times of uncertainty, look for the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to guide us through this season that we're in. I love to look at the message translation often when I'm looking at Scripture like this. And, and Eugene Peterson, who is the, the translator for that, that uh, paraphrase, has a great way of putting this verse and the next verse behind it. I want to look at that in the message. And this is Galatians chapter 5, 25 and 26 in the message. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our hearts or a sentiment in our hearts, but walk out its implications in every detail of our lives. But work out its implications in every detail of our lives. You know, several pastors and psychologists over the years have tried to identify stages of faith, how a person comes to believe what they believe. And it's, it's interesting, as a child, we kind of start with a, a, a childlike faith, and it's often a borrowed faith that we develop. If we come up in a, a family, a church family that is following Christ, then often as we develop our personal faith, it starts as a borrowed faith of our family. Uh, if you're an adult who comes to know Christ, often you're borrowing the faith of someone who's influenced you and, and given you the opportunity to accept the offer of Christ and become a Christ follower. It doesn't mean that you're not a Christian. It doesn't mean that you don't have your own faith, but it means so much of what you believe, so much of what you apply in your life is borrowed from the people who have influenced you to that point. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about this because I think we can read a verse like this of keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, and we can say publicly that we fully believe that at a high level and that that's our public confession or conviction that we have, when in reality, when it comes down to our core belief and how we actually walk out our life, we often check out and don't even recognize the role of the Holy Spirit in our life. You know, as they talk about stages of faith, as we talk about belief systems, there's really three ways that we can approach a conviction that we have. There's a public conviction, and that's the, the public persona that we want to pre pre present to other people, that, that we want people to believe that we believe a certain thing. So that's what we share publicly. Then there's a private conviction, and that's what we, in our heart of hearts, hope that we believe, something that we articulate internally, but it hasn't been vetted, it hasn't been tested. And it hasn't been really owned to the point that we, we believe it's 100% true. And then there's a core conviction. When you get to the core conviction level, that's what you actually believe. That's what will actually walk out when stress is put on you, when an action comes into play. The core belief is what will shine over your public conviction, over your personal conviction. It'll be your core belief that really shines into who you are and what you really believed. And I really believe this, and it's, it's just part of the growing up process of really owning our own faith, that a belief that is never tested is only a hypothesis. It's only a hypothesis. And so today, I'm going to take you on a journey on this topic, and I'm going to take you on a journey that uh, is going to take you some places that I don't normally share. It's not a story that I just naturally choose to share about on a regular basis, but it goes back to the, the largest fight or flight response that I've had in my adult life. And the reason I want to share that is because I feel like in these last 30 days especially that God's really laid on my heart that so many of us need to be careful about getting out of step with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to lead us through this time. And He yearns for us to really seek Him in this unique uncertain time and to really be led by Him through this season. And so I want to go back to a time 27 years ago. It actually was 27 years ago this week. I was in my last year of seminary. I had been uh, through a day of classes, and I had come back to the office where Stephanie worked in financial aid at ORU, and it was toward the end of the day, around 4 or 4.30. And I got a phone call, and that phone call was my mom and brother on the other line, and they were saying words but because of the frantic nature of how they were sharing it, 
that fight or flight reflex started kicking in and I felt that burn in my neck. I felt the adrenaline flowing. I felt the muscles tighten. I felt my heart rate race because the words they were sharing were that my father, who was a pastor in Alabama, had been shot. They were rushing him by ambulance to the hospital and they weren't sure if he was going to make it or not. And that was the, the conversation. Uh, I had a, a short conversation because they were trying to get to him. They were trying to figure out what was going on and all the chaos. And so I had just a brief moment to hang up the phone, try to convey to my wife what was going on. My sister was a sophomore at ORU. We just started her sophomore year. She was in the dorm, and I had to walk across campus. This was the days before texting and, and cell phones and all that. So I had to walk across campus, run across campus, and try to find her and try to convey what little bit I knew of what had happened to our dad. So I found her in the parking lot before she had made it to her dorm, and, and we were crying, but we got her in the car, and we took her back to our apartment across the street there from ORU, and we were sitting there waiting for some update. And I can remember just getting on my knees and just calling out to God, and just begging God to spare his life. I had no idea the context of what had happened. I had no idea of what was going on. There were no text updates. There was nothing going on. And it seemed like it was forever in that moment. It was less than an hour. But it seemed like it was more of a lifetime of sitting there wondering what was going to happen. And then the phone rang. It was my mom telling me that my dad had passed away. Well, that adrenaline kept pumping. I don't even remember the full conversation. We got no other details other than that he had passed away at the hospital. I let my mom know that I was going to take my sister and my wife. We were going to get in the car. We were going to drive overnight. We were going to get there, and we were going to figure it out as a family. So we did that. We packed up the car. It was about sundown when we headed out, and adrenaline was going off the chart. I mean... There was silence in the car. There was nothing that I could really say, but I could feel my body just, just pumping adrenaline into the whole situation. And we went for hours without even saying a word. We were trying to pray. We didn't know what to say. But about 3.30 in the morning, as we were about 100 miles from home, the adrenaline was all gone. I had burned through it all, and I just got to a place where I couldn't even stay awake, and we just stopped the car, and I slept for about an hour. And then we got up and started driving again, and then the sun was rising as we were driving into Alabama. And I turned the radio on, and I started hearing the news report of a pastor in our home city there that had been murdered, and I realized the pastor that they were talking about was my dad. And I started hearing details of it that I didn't even know overnight as I had been driving. Well, we got home. My family was all there. We were trying to process what happened, and I got to hear the story of, of what had happened. My dad had finished his work day. He had gone out in the breezeway. He had put a briefcase in his car, and as he'd been coming back in the office, someone came up and shot him, and after he was shot, he actually blocked the doorway to the office where my mom was, and he actually saved her life by doing that. The ambulance was called. The ambulance and EMT guys were there. They put him in the ambulance. He was praying in tongues. He was speaking. He was praying. And the ambulance EMTs uh, started making fun of him. But the ambulance driver yelled back at him and said, he was a backslidden Christian. And he yelled back at him and he said, hey, guys, he's calling out to God. You guys need to knock it off. And that next day, that ambulance driver rededicated his life to Christ by the witness of how my dad had died. They took him to the hospital in that community. My dad was known. He was a pastor in the community. The nurses, the doctors, they did everything they could to save his life. But as they moved him to the surgery room, as they were moving him to the surgery table, he raised his hands. He said, thank you, Jesus. And he was gone. I'd love to tell you that there are simple answers when things like that happen in life. But there's no simple answer. 
And if you live long enough in this broken world, you're going to have an event, maybe not like that, but you're going to have an event that's going to take you to your core belief. I had so many questions. I had so many different things that I wanted answers to that there were no answers to. After seven days, they were able to find out who had killed my dad. We went through the funeral, and my sister and my wife and I decided to come back to Tulsa to finish the semester, and and we just decided we were going to come back and do whatever we could to cope and figure out what to do next. And in these next few minutes, I want to share with you the journey that I went on as I came back, because I came back and uh, we were back to where we had been, but it was anything but normal. And I have to believe today that the way the Holy Spirit put this on my heart, that there are a lot of you today that are in need of exactly what I had to do in finding a way to get in step with the Holy Spirit in an uncertain time. So let's take a moment and let's just talk about that season of time. It's interesting to me as I think about that season that uh, there was so much pain involved in it. I think C.S. Lewis is an amazing author. I want to use this quote just to kind of transition into this next part. But C.S. Lewis said this, Pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I was struggling to make sense of it all. I was going through the motion of going to classes. I was going to church. I had people around me saying they were praying for me, and I needed all of those things. But there were a couple things that I did that helped me move in a way from a borrowed faith about the Holy Spirit to an own faith that still impacts who I am today. And I think it would be a tragedy if we didn't share these kinds of experiences with our family and with our church, because all of us need to have these experiences of transitioning from a borrowed faith to an own faith. In times of uncertainty, we need to look for the Holy Spirit. On the fourth floor of the Graduate Center at ORU, there's a preaching lab, and it's mostly deserted except for classes when people are in there preaching. And so when I got back the the week after my dad passed away, I started slipping into that preaching lab. And those first few days, I just sat in there, and I I couldn't even get a word out. I started understanding when when the Scripture talks about praying and groaning in words that can't be expressed. And I sat there, numb to it all, just trying to make sense out of it. I had so many questions. So many things were going through my mind. But I made a place. And day after day as I went back, I started doing things. In the first first few days, it was silence. After that, though, I I started uh, having conversations with God. I would uh, start and I would say, God, I have no explanation for why a preacher who is doing your will would be killed in the prime of his life. But I have no better explanation of life than to trust you. So I leaned into that. I would pray that over and over again. I would run out of words in English, and I wasn't feeling anything, but I I was determined that I was going to say, God, if you're real, you're going to meet me here, and I'm going to make myself available to you. So over and over again, I would just start and I would pray. And I would run out of words in English and I would start praying in the Spirit. Uh, Many of you, you know this is a Pentecostal church. You know we believe in the prayer language, that we have the ability to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And some of you haven't really experienced that or you experienced that and you thought it was a one-time event. But let me tell you, there is a richness to your life when you have the prayer language of the Holy Spirit and you use it on a regular basis, it keeps you in step with the Holy Spirit. When you don't know what to pray, pray in the Spirit. 
spirit baptism. There's power in praying in tongues. So over and over again, I would sit there. I would pace the floor. I would go back and forth. I'd say, God, I still, I don't understand. I may never understand. But I believe that you're real. I believe that your word is true. And I'm going to pray this through until I, I make sense out of this. There was no feeling. There was no uh, exuberance or excitement in anything I was doing. But there was a commitment that I was going to go until I found something. The other thing that I did in that season of time was to take my Bible and just read through the Psalms. Over and over again, the Holy Spirit would lift a psalm to me, and I would just read it, and I would continue to meditate on it. And there was a particular psalm that, that just uh, locked in in that season. For over a year, as I was going through school, this is the psalm that I would just quote to myself. I would open it in my Bible. In fact, this is the Bible that I had all those years ago. This was my seminary Bible that year, and I keep it. And I keep it in my office at home, and I pull it out in times like this when we're in these uncertain times, and I open it to this page. There's, there's uh, all kinds of uh, hand oil that's on this. You can see the yellowing of this page because it's been open, and my hands have been all over it. But Psalm 62 became a living reality to me, and I would just pray it out loud. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my fortress. I will not be shaken. Find rest, my soul, in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. When you don't know what to say, read the Bible out loud. When you don't know what to pray, pray in the Spirit. There's power that has been made available to you and me in times of uncertainty. It was God's plan from the beginning. When Jesus was leaving his disciples, he said, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm sending someone that's going to teach you all things. He's going to be a comforter. He's going to be an instructor. He's going to be a guide to you. He's going to open up the God's plan and his will for your life. But if we're out of step, if we say we're being led by the Spirit, that we want to be people of the Spirit, but we're out of step... We're going to miss the opportunity in the season that we're in to really live the life that God wants us to live. As I did that day after day, going before class, going after class, the tears started moving from tears of loss, of the grief of not having my father, to tears because God's presence started showing up. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. The Bible tells us that a bruised reed he will not break. And when we're talking about that, if you've been injured, if you're going through a tragic situation right now, if you're going through stress that's off the charts, you can know that the Holy Spirit is just one prayer away. He hasn't left you. He hasn't decided that you're a lost cause. He's there, and He's going to encourage you, and He's going to see you through that season. It's God's plan for the Holy Spirit to walk this life with us. In times of uncertainty, look for the Holy Spirit. Since we live by the Spirit, let us stay in step with the Spirit. Not long after my dad passed away, after the police had done their investigation, the police came to our house and they delivered an evidence bag. They had a bag of different kinds of uh, personal effects that he had with him that day. And, and my family took the bag and I was immediately drawn as, as they were uh, giving us the bag, as we kind of took the items out. I was drawn to the shoes that he had worn that day. I think shoes are a marker of the journey that you and I are on. All of us have a pathway that we're taking. We're talking about walking it out. We're talking about staying in step with the Holy Spirit. And these shoes were a reminder to me of the journey that he had taken. 
And when I think about the journey that he took, the way that he lived his life all the way to the end, one of the things that I really believe made me able to go to that room and to really find God for myself in a new way was because of the legacy of the way that he lived his life all the way to the end. And so parents, your kids are going to be looking for your shoes. These shoes tell the story of your journey. All the marks, maybe the dust that's on them, the journey of your life is going to be told through the shoes that you pass down. You and I are on a journey. And my hope and prayer is that the shoes that I leave for my kids and for the generations behind me are going to be shoes that they can hold up and they can say that they were in step with the Holy Spirit. Here in a moment, we're going to have an opportunity for a response and I want to give you an opportunity to really affirm that you want to connect with the Holy Spirit and you want to be in step with Him. Since we live by the Spirit, let us stay in step with the Spirit. In times of uncertainty, look for the Holy Spirit. How long has it been since you've slowed down and you've given place to receive from the Holy Spirit. What's keeping you from that today? He's just a prayer away. You don't have to go by your feelings. It's not going to be a service necessarily where you have an exuberant experience where you're going to say that was the Holy Spirit. You're going to go by His promise. He's never going to leave you or forsake you. And the Holy Spirit wants to be an active part in this season of your life. And praying in the Spirit, meditating on the Spirit, and giving opportunity for the Spirit to speak to you. We're going to make all the difference in the world in the season that we're in. I can't imagine all the different situations that are represented online today. I don't know what you may be going through. Maybe you just lost your job. Maybe you're going through some marital conflict. Maybe you've just gone through a divorce. Maybe you're about to pull your hair out because your kids are having to online school at home. I have no idea what the stress may be, but I'm convinced that if we will walk in step with the Holy Spirit, we will succeed and thrive in this season no matter what comes our way. In uncertain times, Let's look for the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the promised Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God, even as uh, we have walked through the story, a portion of my life, God, that you have spoken exactly what was needed to each person. Lord, I thank you that you're a personal God. I thank you that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is real. And I pray even now, as we've been challenged to really look to your Holy Spirit for guidance and direction in this time, Lord, I pray that you're going to give us the boldness and the courage to make changes in our schedule, God, to make space for you, God, to put priority with you, God, so that we can thrive through this season so that we can live a life that truly makes a difference. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy to us today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to take a next step today, maybe you've heard me talking about the Holy Spirit and you have a lot of questions about what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Our staff would love to hear from you. You can use that connect form. You can also start a chat right now, even in the chat. And I would love the opportunity even in the weeks ahead as we get through this quarantine of meeting you one-on-one and sharing more about how the Holy Spirit can be a part of your life. If you're not a believer and you're hearing things and you've heard this language and you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about, but something is drawing me, that is the Holy Spirit. 
And I want to encourage you to take a next step. Will you let us know? Will you use that Connect card? Let us know that you want us to call you and talk to you and give you some more information. And it will give us an opportunity to share with you who Jesus is and the opportunity you have to take this journey of being a Christ follower. But there's another step I'd love for a lot of us to take, and that's uh, to go in your closet today. Before you finish up uh, your church experience on this weekend, I'd love for you to go in your closet. I want you to find a pair of shoes. I don't care which shoes they are. You might want to find one that's been on the journey a little bit longer than the brand new ones you got for the start of school. But I want you to find a pair of shoes. I want you to take a picture of those shoes. You can take them with them on. You can take them in your hand, whatever you want to do. And then I want you to post it. That way I'll at least have some more pictures to look at that won't stress me out. You can post it. And then I want you to also tag our church. And I want you to put the words walking it out. And you're going to walk it out. You're going to walk worthy of the call. You're going to walk in the peace of God. And you're going to walk in step with the Holy Spirit because I believe there's going to be power and you're going to have an opportunity even if you post something like that somebody's going to ask you why are you showing a picture of your shoes it'll give you an opportunity to share that you're wanting to keep in step with the Holy Spirit and that you're on a walk that is going to make a difference in your life and in the lives of the people in your family and the people who know you well thank you for joining us on the weekend experience we are so honored that you were a part there are so many great things that will be coming. Stay in tune throughout the week. Social media, text blast. It's going to take us a little while to sort out just how soon we can all get back. But we are going to come back, and we don't even want to miss a beat. We want this to continue. There's a momentum in this church. There's a momentum going forward in our lives. And we know that this is just an interruption to that of us not being able to be together. But we're a church whether we're in a building or not. And we're, we're called to go into the community. You know, our mission is to serve neighbors and nations. And I just charge you up. I want you to go out this week, make a difference in your life, and serve neighbors and nations as you see God change the world. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week, everybody.